Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're, we're addressing this question. I want you to think about it as you turn to 1 Peter 1, How did we get our Bibles, and how do we know our Bibles are free from error? And that is so important if you want to be sure you're going to heaven, if you want to be sure you're saved, if you want to be sure your sins are forgiven. Because the Bible says that the way we got saved is by the engrafted Word of God. And it's the Word of God that, that, that brings faith to our lives. And as we hear the Word of God, and as the, the Word of God affects us, we're sanctified. And so to have a, a Bible that impacts us, we have to know that we have God's word that is like silver refined in a furnace seven times. That's how God describes the Bible. He said it's like silver that you refine and refine and refine and refine so that it has no impurities in it. That's the living and abiding word of God. Look at verse 22 of 1 Peter 1. It says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. That just described what a, an, an active, committed Christian looks like. That's verse 22. Now look at verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the living and abiding Word of God that is able to purify souls. Now, now keep reading verse 24. Because all flesh is like grass, and all the glory of man is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Totally bound together is our salvation, our sanctification, our, our effective living with a book we can trust. Now, that brings us back to how did we get our Bibles? How do we know that our Bibles are free from errors? Well, I believe, and I started this last time, I believe the Bible is truly God's word, number one. Most of all, you don't need anything else because Jesus believed that. And secondly, every writer said so. 40 plus authors, and they collectively say thousands of times, this isn't from me, this is from God. Thirdly, and we saw this all last time, because of the incredible unity of the Bible. Though over 1,600 years it was written by 40 different men on three different continents, most of whom never met each other, it fits together better than anything that could ever be engineered because of its fulfilled prophecy. Uh, that's the self-authentication because the Bible alone has fulfilled prophecy. No other religious uh, literature of any uh, group, major religion has prophecy. Because of the scientific accuracy that is contained, now the Bible is not written as a science textbook, but anything scientific it says, it is accurate to the extent that science is still catching up. Because remember, science is the observation of the world around us, and the scriptures are from the perfect and greatest observer of all, and so anything he observes is scientifically accurate. And then we ended last time because the archaeological verification, I took you with William Ramsey, and we went through uh, the book of Acts. The last element is where we are tonight. Because of its endurance through the ages, because of, and we can call this the preservation of the Bible, not just that, that it, it was pure and flawless from the mouth of God as the breath of God came out, but that God has authenticated what we have in our hands so that we know because of the way that God had the Scriptures always under custodianship, always under what we would call, you know, lock and seal. Uh, in other words, if, if you open a bottle of Tylenol, and I'm, you know, I'm not advertising, I sold Advil, by the way, when I was going through seminary, but if you opened a bottle of Tylenol, I don't know why anybody would, but if you opened one, and looked at it, if it doesn't have what? 
yeah, you go, whoa, I'm taking it back to Walmart because something's wrong here. It's not verified that it's been under the custodianship of that seal. That's how the Bible is. It was always under the custodianship, the, the safety net, as we'll see in the Old Testament, of the prophets and priests, and in the New Testament, of Christ and his apostles. Always the books that are in this book. That's why no matter how many times it says in the National Geographic or the National Enquirer or New York Times or the Time Magazine that they found a missing book of the Bible, you can just chuckle and say they're trying to sell more copies of their, you know, whatever, because there are no books missing because they were always under the custodianship in the Old Testament of the prophets and priests. And then the New Testament, Jesus Christ affirmed that the Old Testament that there were no missing books, that there is no pseudepigrapha or apocrypha or anything else that needs to be added. And Jesus affirmed the 24, which are 39 in our Bible, books of the Hebrew Bible. And then he said, I'm sending the New Testament through my apostles, and it will only come through them. And they are the ones that verified the content. So, basically, God's word has endured through the ages, despite being the target of empires and armies and infidels. Our children, uh, in fact, thank you, Ken. That was a blessing because I felt like I was back the way I grew up. I mean, I didn't need the hymn book tonight because we had to sing all those hymns when I was growing up. And we sang them so many times. I knew every verse of every stanza. But one of the ones we used to have to sing is this one. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted through the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal and they glow with the light divine. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand though the earth may crumble. I will take my stand on its firm foundation. For the Bible stands. The Bible stands every scrutiny, it, it stands every attack, it has withstood every time anybody has sought to either undermine its veracity or destroy it completely. Uh, probably the best way to put it is we need to trust the God of the Bible because God sent us his word and confirmed it was from him. In the Old Testament, he confirmed it by the prophets and priests. You know what I see in here? This is my old copy, Dan. Look in Dropbox and see if there's a... Can you see Dropbox? Um, that's the problem. I work on this too long, but I can still speak this, but you missed the good part. I'll tell you what you missed. Never mind, Dan, you don't need Dropbox. I'll just tell you about it. The closest the Bible ever got to extinction was from the year 303 to 311 A.D. You've heard of Diocletian? Diocletian decided he was the emperor of the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. When Rome went from Britain all the way to the steppes of Russia, all the way down to uh, the Sahara regions of Africa, and all the way over toward India, when Rome was at its zenith, the greatest emperor as far as his civil ability, he did the sewers, he did the road systems, he did the education system, he did everything well. And he was so much wanting Rome to be great. He saw a problem. He called it a, a cancer. There were more and more people who wouldn't go to the games. They wouldn't go to the Colosseum. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be involved in a lot of the activities, athletic, cultural, civic activities, because of the paganism, because of the, the horrible bloodshed, and because of the immodesty. And because of that, there was this growing detachment from society of the cancer, the Christians. So in 303, he decided to return Rome to its greatness. And what Diocletian did is he decided he was going to get rid of every church building. Wherever Christians met, he was going to raise the building, just, just destroy it completely. Secondly, every leader, every pastor, he was going to get rid of, either in prison or execute. And finally, every copy of the Bible. You know what? He was so effective, there's no, no standing church from, that predates Diocletian. He destroyed every church building that, that was in use. He imprisoned or killed every pastor, and there's no complete copy of the Bible from before 303 AD. Every single one 
complete copy was destroyed. Now, how do we still have the Bible? Because people just, when they, they, I mean, they didn't have the internet back then. It took days and weeks to get stuff to the furthest ends. And as the news traveled, people immediately started tearing their Bibles into pieces and and sharing them. And so everybody had a piece. That's why we have 25,000 fragmentary manuscripts of the New Testament. So, in the Old Testament, the custodianship was the prophets and the priests. And God had all of the Old Testament books, as they were being written, brought into the custodianship of the prophets and priests. In the New Testament, it was Christ and his apostles. So how did we actually get the written down word of God that we have and hold in our Bibles today? Here's a brief history of the transmission of the word of God. Now, let's just talk about how did we get the Bible. Um, Basically, there are four stages in the history of the transmission of the Bible to us. Before Moses, that's from creation to 1500 B.C., all of that, the book of Hebrews says, that God in divers manners and sundry times spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But it was before the time of Moses, there was no written word. So you don't have written down text. It was what you would call oral tradition, stories passed down. But anything from the pre-written time that God wanted, Moses or others incorporate into the written word of God. But Moses was the first writing prophet of the scriptures. Moses, basically the Exodus was in 1446 BC, and Moses sat down and began to record the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And that period of time, which we call the the Old Testament era, goes from Moses to Ezra. And if you look in, in your Bibles, Deuteronomy 31, 9 says this, when Moses finished uh, in fact, this is a key book to understand the custodianship. Look at, at Deuteronomy with me, 31.9. Because when Moses finished writing down the word of God, this is what it says. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this is the first time right here that we see, now it's also in Exodus 24, it's also in, in Exodus 17, the same concept. Uh, that, that I wrote down here, but it's clearest in Deuteronomy 31.9. Basically, Moses, when he got done writing, put it into the ark of the, or the uh, tabernacle. The, the Ten Commandments went in the Ark of the Covenant, and the rest went into the tabernacle and was under the, the care of the priests. In fact, you remember when Manasseh was the wickedest king and the longest serving king and he totally turned the temple into a pagan sanctuary and the Bible was lost. Do you remember who found it? The priests found it when they cleaned out the junk in the temple. Why? Because it was always guarded and treasured and under the custodianship of the priests. And so as they saw the king more and more opposed to the true and living God, sacrificing children and having all kinds of horrific things, they hid the scrolls of the Old Testament in the temple. So the writing uh, prophet Moses starts and, and writes down and gives everything into the custodianship of the priests and of the, the prophets gave it into the custodianship of the priests. Now, the second writing era and the third of the stages of the Bible is from Ezra to the Apostle John. Basically, that covers Ezra is about 445 B.C., 447, 448, depending on what study Bible you have. So I said 5th or 6th century B.C., 500 B.C., through the end of the lifetime of the Apostle John. And we're going to discuss this tonight, but most of us don't even realize how important this guy is, Ezra. Next to Moses, this guy, next to him, to Jews, Ezra's number two. They owe more to Ezra than to anyone else. Modern Jewish scholars look at Ezra as the father of biblical Hebrew, as the father of of the synagogues, as the father of Judaism as we know it today as far as its connection to the scripture. Because, and we'll talk about how Ezra did that. The first thing that Ezra did is, Ezra had to recopy 
all of the, the copies of the Word of God, the scrolls, the manuscripts, the collection of God's Word that came from Moses through the time of the prophets, through David, all the way up to his time. He had to recopy them. And, and the reason is, and I'll show you in a moment, is because the people couldn't read them anymore. Because Hebrew had morphed, just like English has. I mean, have you ever read? Uh, I have, when I pastored in New England, someone gave me a 1772 dictionary of the United States, uh, um, printed in Philadelphia, of the English language. I mean, you can hardly understand half the words on any page. We don't spell them the same. Our letters are not shaped the same. It's unbelievable just what's happened in 200 years here. Look what's going on for a thousand years. They're writing the inspired word, but they couldn't understand it. So Ezra recopied it. Ezra reordered the order. In fact, we'll see in a moment. I'll show you the, the books of the Bible he put into three divisions. Uh, he divided all of the... Uh, boy, that woke some of you up. You're thinking basketball right away. Divisions, you know. Uh, no, he, the divisions of the scriptures. And he called it the law, the prophets, and the writings. And he, he organized them that way. And we find that in the Old Testament. And then all of this work that Isaiah or that Ezra did became the basis for what we call the Septuagint right here. That's the number LXX is 70 in Roman numerals. And the LXX is a, the abbreviation for the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of Ezra's copied over manuscripts. And by the way, the Septuagint is the Bible that Jesus used, the Old Testament. That's what, when, when, when Jesus reads from a Hebrew manuscript, he's reading from the copied one that, that Ezra assembled. But when Jesus quotes something, it's interesting, he quotes from the Septuagint about 90% of the time. And so Jesus, number one, authorized and said that what, what Ezra did was the Scripture, and the translation of it into Greek, Jesus by his use affirmed. And then that takes us into the post-apostolic time. Jesus commissioned his apostles who wrote the New Testament. And from AD 100 to today, we have holding in our hands an Old Testament that was verified by Christ and a New Testament that was always under the custodianship of the apostles. And because of the Diocletian that I already told you about, the emperor, that, that almost he was the one that was closest to destroying the church. Under Diocletian, we have many, many manuscript fragments because people just broke the Bible up in as small pieces as possible. So those are the stages of God's word. Now, let, let me explain to you. Moses, from 1500 B.C., Moses was influenced. Remember, he went to Egyptian schools. So whatever his written language, his folks had taught him, that was probably some form of Aramaic that, that is from the Middle East, from where Abraham came from. But whatever he had became influenced by this. This is hieroglyphics. If you've ever heard of the, the, the writing that's all over Egypt, it's just a whole bunch of symbols and characters and animal shapes. And that, if you think about it, if you're around something long enough, it begins to affect you, just like... If you're around someone that uses slang, pretty soon you pick it up. Moses was schooled in Egyptian. And yet Moses was called by God to write his scripture. So what Moses wrote in was the language of his day as he wrote the word of God. So we're, we're talking 15 centuries before Christ with an influence of hieroglyphics. Well, then we get to the next period. Remember, I, I talked about there, there actually is the period of Moses here. Then there's the, the period of David and all the prophets. And then we have the time of Ezra. So there's, within this, this writing of the Old Testament, there are actually three very clear segments. Moses, who launched it. The period of time around David, the, the height, David and Solomon, 1000 B.C. And then the captivity, the wind down, and the return to the land. 
During the time of David, the, the most influential group of people were the merchants. They were called the Phoenicians. Now, you've all heard of Phoenicians because they were the people, if you've heard of Hannibal and the elephants, they were the Carthaginians were part of the Phoenicians, the people of Tyre and Sidon, and you've read about that in Ezekiel. They were Phoenicians. And basically, all around, if this is the Mediterranean basin with uh, you know, Italy sticking down in it, the whole Mediterranean basin was settled by the Phoenicians all the way around. They settled over here in Israel. They settled down here in Carthage. Uh, they, they had outposts way down here in Spain, and they tried to conquer the Roman Empire, and that's what Hannibal did, and he came up with his elephants and tried to cross the Alps and attack Rome. The, the Phoenicians were incredibly rich, and prosperous and very, very mobile. They sailed all over the Mediterranean basis. One of their biggest outposts was right here by Israel, and it was called Tyre. In fact, to know how powerful they were, when God describes Satan in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, God starts with describing the king of Tyre and his his great wealth and his great pride, and he morphs into, in Ezekiel 28, talking about Satan and saying, king of Phoenicians, you're as proud as Satan was, and you're headed to destruction just like I destroyed, threw Satan down from his high and lofty place. So the Phoenicians dominated the commercial world. They were the maritimers. They're the ones that hauled everything around in the time of the Bible. Their language, the trade language, is what, you remember um, Hiram that was helping Solomon float the, you know, or helping David float the logs to, to get for Solomon to build the temple? Phoenician language was the trade language. And so all of the prophets and David wrote his inspired words of God down, but this is what it looked like. This is what the Phoenicianized Hebrew look like? It looks a little bit like biblical Hebrew, but it's still got these funny, you know, shields and ladders, you know, and, um, you know, badminton sticks. It just, and, you know, the number four and a W. I mean, just it's really strange stuff. But this is the Phoenician language that they would have captured the Word of God in. And in this second period, you know, Moses, heavily Egyptian influenced, David, heavily influenced by the Phoenicians. Now we get to Ezra. And what happens by the time of Ezra is something big has happened, and that's the Babylonian captivity. And in, in 586 BC, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Temple destroyed. All the people killed, enslaved, and carried off as captives. And for 70 years, for two or for one and a half, however you want to call it, generations, they weren't in Israel. They weren't under the tutelage of Jerusalem. They were in Babylon. And during that time, the people completely lost their ability to even read the Bible. They had to have it read to them. They couldn't even understand. You find Ezra standing up and reading out loud the scriptures because the people couldn't read it. And they stood in the rain for hours as he read the Bible to them. But what Ezra realized was he had to reconquer the Hebrew language. So this alphabet right here, this is the Hebrew alphabet, you know, Aleph and Beth and Gimel and Daleth. Know how, notice how each of these letters fits nicely in a nice little square box. They're all, they're not like the badminton rackets and ladders that you saw in Phoenician. Every one of them fits in a nice little square box. This is block letter, uh, biblical, this is modern Hebrew. This is the language, the, the alphabet that modern Hebrew that's spoken today comes from. This is also biblical Hebrew. And this was invented by Ezra. That's what I mean by Ezra fathers modern biblical Hebrew. He invented this alphabet and then he personally hand copied all of the books of Moses into that form, all of the writing of the prophets, 
And then he personally also took Nehemiah's work. Ezra wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. It's Nehemiah's words, but Ezra is the one that wrote them down. And he copied all of the books of the Bible into this biblical Hebrew. But he didn't stop there. He enlisted a group of men to learn that and to learn the copying process and to start copying the scriptures. And they became known as the scribes, the ones that you read about that were bothering Jesus all the time. They were a professional group of Ezra trained, hundreds of years later, uh, copyists of the scriptures. And then, to top it off, Ezra, I mean, do you see why the, the Jewish people admire him so much? He gave them their language, the alphabet that they use today, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. He started the, the guardians and copyists of the scrolls. Have you ever heard about the people that would, you know, uh, write the name of God and go wash their pen and their body and everything else, and they would only write one word, and if they found it made any mistakes, they'd burn the whole thing and start over again? That's these people. And so this, this scribal work was instituted by Ezra, this this training. So he, he, because the temple was destroyed and so many people were off in the diaspora, you know what that means? That's the spreading of Israel all over to every nation on the planet through slavery and through pogroms and through persecutions. They were just spread everywhere like it says in Leviticus they would be, like it says in Deuteronomy they would be. God would, would hound them to the furthest corners of the earth because of their disobedience. He instituted these portable training centers, any place that you could get 10 Jewish men, a minion. If you had 10, you had a synagogue. Obviously, Philippi didn't have one because Paul looked for it, and he only found a group of women praying by the river. So there were Jewish women and some Jewish men, but there weren't enough, 10, to have a synagogue. You had to wait till you had 10, then you had a synagogue. So Ezra instituted the synagogues, the ones we see in the New Testament. Ezra founded them. The ones that Paul visits all through his missionary journeys. Ezra is the one that founded that whole movement of the Sun Agoge, the gathering places of the Jewish people, where they read the scriptures that he copied into modern biblical Hebrew. Ezra is an amazing man. So basically, Deuteronomy 31.9, and now this is the custodianship. This is what I want you to understand, how we know that the Old Testament you can trust. Every part of it. Not just the, you know, the fun parts of the Psalms. Every part of it. When Moses wrote his five books, he delivered them, as Deuteronomy 31.9 says, into the hands of the priest, the custodianship of the priest. When Moses died, Joshua finishes off the life of Moses and records the conquest, and he delivers it the same place, into the care of the priests, in the temple, in the tabernacle, and then in the temple uh, when Solomon built it. Then Samuel, I mean, there are others. There, there are other writing uh, prophets in between here, but just showing the, the major ones. Samuel, again takes it and puts it into this, this body of, of literature inspired by God. Now, there are many other letters. There are thousands of other bits and pieces of all kinds of, of writings from all throughout this time period. But the ones that, that God breathed out, when Moses started the writing of scriptures, only the ones that were kept in the temple, by the priesthood, guided by the prophets, only those were considered scripture. There are many writings, and, 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 and some of the intertestamental, the pseudo-pigrapha, pseudo is the false, pigrapha is the writings, the grapha, or the apocrypha that some of you from Catholic backgrounds have heard, those some of those were, were known in this time period and rejected. And the rest of them, just beyond this time period, is Christ. And Christ said, I don't want any of And he said, no, none of the pseudopigrapha, none of the apocrypha, none of that did Jesus ever call Scripture. 
So it doesn't matter if a council or a Catholic church says you need them. If they were present in Christ's time, the intertestamental apocryphal books were present in Christ's time, no. Those are not scripture, and he didn't accept them. But all of these, the prophets, when, when Jonah wrote his prophecy, it went right in here. When Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, all of them right here, and they were collected by Ezra. Ezra lived right up until the time of Malachi. And, and when Malachi finished it, Ezra copied it into his biblical Hebrew, and that was it. And that became what Jesus called the Old Testament scriptures. Now notice how Ezra arranged the Old Testament books into the three-part Hebrew scriptures we see described in the New Testament. And where we see those described is, look in Luke 40, 24, 44 in your Bible. I want you to see this because it's fascinating to see the reflections. Luke 24 and verse 44. And this is what, when Jesus is teaching, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses. That is the Hebrew Torah. The Hebrew word Torah means teacher. Torah, the, the teacher, the, the Torah, the law is, is, law is not so much like, you know, stop signs and everything as it is the teachings, the, the Torah. Uh, the, the teachings of God. And that's the first five books. So, so Ezra said, the first division of the scriptures, this first piece here is called the Torah, the five books of Moses. Then the Nevi'im, that's the word, look what it says in verse 44, the law of Moses and the prophets. That's the Hebrew word for a prophet. So Jesus, Jesus is reflecting and affirming and declaring that the arrangement of the Old Testament books into three parts in what are known as the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, or we call it the Old Testament, that that he verifies. He says, these books, Moses wrote these, Jesus said, the, the books of the law of Moses, the writing of the prophets. Now, now look why they only have 24 books. These, we know, Samuel we have first and second. They just have one. Kings, we have first and second. Uh, then here, they lump all the minor prophets. In fact, this morning, some of you might have noticed that when I was talking about the potter's field and throw 30 pieces of silver and all that, did you know what, what Matthew said? He said in Matthew 27, 3, or actually verses 9 and 10, you know what he says? As is written... In Jeremiah. That isn't in Jeremiah. That's in here in Zechariah. But you know what? In, in the scroll, Jeremiah, which has 52 chapters and is huge, Jeremiah was lumped like this in the scroll because Isaiah, you know, Isaiah was in itself six, six chapters. It was huge. And this was lumped but when you get here, after Isaiah, they lumped Jeremiah, and the front book of these 14 books is Jeremiah. And so often they would refer to that section as Jeremiah, which is exactly what Matthew does. Matthew followed this Old Testament lumping. So even though it was in the, the chapters written by Zechariah, it was in the, the division of the scrolls written with Jeremiah as its head. So that's the middle division, the prophets. Then right here, the third part, look back at verse 44. It says, uh, written in the law of Moses, the Torah, the prophets, the Nevaim, and then the Psalms, the, the Ketuvim, or Ketuvim. Uh, this is what the writings, actually, is what it is, uh, which are the Psalms. And uh, so Jesus reflects these three divisions. And uh, you see again here that, that Ezra and Nehemiah is one book, Chronicles, first and second, is one book, and uh, the others are, are individual, and all 150 of the Psalms are one continuous book. They didn't have quite the divisions that we have. But those are the three parts that Jesus affirmed. So now we go from that back and look at, look at what Jesus said. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. All things must be fulfilled which are written. Now earlier, 
Jesus in Matthew 5 had called this same collection scriptures. So Jesus called the f- three divisions, the Torah, the Nevim, and the Ketuvim, the Psalms, Prophets, and Law of Moses, he called that the scriptures. Jesus authenticated the 24 books of the Old Testament that are, when you break them down, are R39. If you, if you add 12 here and, and add 2, 4, 6, 7, see, you, you end up with all 39 if you break them out into all the pieces that we have. But they had, according to Ezra's counting. Now, we go after Ezra. From the time of Ezra, the scriptures, the three parts, a big event happened, and I mentioned this to you. From 280 B.C. to 180 B.C., Remember, we're counting back. So 280 is just after the time of Alexander. So Alexander comes through, Alexander the Great, and he, he Hellenizes, that's Greek influences the whole world, gets them all speaking Greek. So now people have their native language, Hebrew or whatever, but they have their public language that all commerce and communication, it's kind of like English is today. Many people in our world have have their, their home tongue, but they do English so they can diplomatically or business get stuff done. That's how it was in this time period. And so after Alexander, everyone started speaking Greek. And, and Koine Greek, Koine is common, that's, that's what the New Testament's written in, it was the public spoken Greek. And so a group of the scholars from the school of Ezra scribes, 72 of them, go to Egypt, and they take Ezra's 24 books, which were the scriptures that Jesus affirmed, and they translated the Hebrew into Greek. And that's what it looks like. That's the Septuagint. That's the Old Testament, this little squiggly stuff here. That's the Old Testament that has been copied into the Greek language, and we know it as the Septuagint. What's interesting is the Septuagint affects us. When you look at our Bible, the Septuagint, these scholars, reordered Ezra's 24 Old Testament books to the pattern we see of 39 today. So actually, our 39 are an afterthought. They found it better to split out all the prophets. They found it better to split out first and seconds and to divide up these books, partly because they they were getting into the reproduction of books back then and of printing, uh, not in printing presses, but of copying. There were whole rooms of people they would read and they would copy. And so they decided, the, the Septuagint translator scholars, they decided on the form the Old Testament has today in the English Bible. Now the Hebrew Bible still follows Ezra. The, they call it the Tanakh. If you, if you witness to a, a Jewish person, it's not the Old Testament. It's the Tanakh. And they follow the 24 book Ezra pattern, but the Septuagint, the Greek translation of that, follows the 39 books. And so, basically this, how do we know that we have the living and abiding Word of God that engrafted saves us and that purifies our souls? Because in the Old Testament, the Scriptures were always under the custodianship of the priests as the prophets wrote. And that custodianship Old Testament in its entirety was copied into 24 books by Ezra. And when Ezra finished that, Jesus Christ called what Ezra did Scripture. And so there's no question that the Old Testament is exactly what God wants us to have. But then Jesus commissions his New Testament apostles. And you remember what what he says? He says that the New Testament is going to be built upon the foundation. And think about what this means. The foundation of the apostles, that's his chosen representatives, and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. So Jesus said, this scripture I've affirmed in the Old Testament 
is going to be concluded in the New Testament under the custodianship of the apostles. And every New Testament book is either written by an apostle or by someone connected to an apostle, as in Peter was connected to Mark, as in Paul was connected to Luke, as in James, who wrote the little epistle of James, and Jude were connected to Christ because they were his earthly brothers, his stepbrothers, as it were. They were Joseph and Mary's children, not Christ's actual uh, blood relatives through his Father in heaven. But every book of the New Testament is attached to an apostle. And when John wrote, remember John is the last living apostle, and near the end of the, of, you know, about 96 AD, he says in Revelation, don't add anything else to the word of God. And he said, I'm the last apostle, and God has just finished his revelation, and don't add to it, or you're going to add the curses. And so what we have is the apostles authenticated what we have today in the 27 books of the New Testament, and Christ authenticated what we have in the 39 books of the Old Testament, and so the Bible we hold today was authenticated by Christ through his apostles. And so any Book of Enoch, any, you know, Nag Hammadi text, that's a place in Egypt where they keep digging this stuff up, is interesting, and it's about the same level as the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica, most of it is true. It's not scripture. A lot of the stuff they're digging up is probably true. True records of things that happen. They're not scripture. Jesus said, only what I have authenticated is the breathed out word of God. And so for us, uh, we can trust our Bible because Jesus authenticated the Old Testament and inspired the New Testament to come. When we pick up next time, I'll show you all the missing parts. I can't wait to show you that I lost, okay? What we're going to do now is, uh, after I pray, I want you to meet our new members and welcome them tonight. But let's thank the Lord. In fact, you've been sitting so long. Why don't you stand? Because that'll, that'll get us all in the, in the gear for prayer. Let's stand and thank the Lord for our living and abiding book. Thank you, Lord, that faith comes by hearing your word and that we are sanctified by your truth. And I pray that you would confirm in the hearts of your servants tonight that this is a book that they can trust because you trusted it. This is a book that, that we can very, very assuredly believe because you did. And the New Testament, even the parts that are culturally against everything our society believes, it's still your truth that you delivered by inspiration through your apostles. And so I pray that we would trust and read and allow your word to nurture our souls. Thank you also tonight for adding to our congregation these 15 wonderful new members. And I pray that tonight as we welcome them that they would feel the love of Christ that is shed abroad in our hearts as we thank you for sending them. May they enrich our fellowship and may we be a blessing to them. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Now, while you stand, don't go away.